we're going to try and do some demos, which, if everyone stays off the Wi-Fi, might work. Um, but it involves connecting to a Kubernetes cluster in the cloud. Uh, so it might also just fail, uh, which will be fine too. Um, and so it's just me. Uh, I originally had a co-presenter. He was responsible for the demos. He didn't make them, and he's also not here. So I spent last night making some demos. Um, so I hope you enjoy them, and I hope they don't crash. Uh, if you're interested, the slides and the video, whenever it's posted, I'll, I'll embed it in the blog post that you can find from this link. Um, and I'll also put the links. Uh, I recorded the demos as well, just in case the demos went really poorly. And if anyone wants to watch them when they get home, uh, you, can, you can go there. OK, looks like people are done taking pictures of that slide. Uh, so yeah, I'm Holden. My preferred pronouns are she or her. I'm a developer advocate at Google. And I'm on the Spark PMC. And I contribute to Beam and a bunch of other projects. I've been at a bunch of other companies. They've all been very nice people and paid me money. Um, I, I put my slides on SlideShare. My Twitter is mostly pictures of coffee, food, and my stuffed animals, like Boo. Um, oh, no, sorry. OK. Uh, and uh, I've started doing code review live streams. It's a mixture of live coding and going through other people's pull requests to Spark. So if you're interested in seeing more about how large open source projects do code reviews. It's a, it's a place to go. If you have feedback on this talk, I do have a, a feedback link. I, I collect everything. I read it. I pass the good ones on to my boss. The bad ones, I read myself. Um, but if you if you have things that you want to say, like please feel free to, to tell me. Um, in addition to who I am professionally, I'm trans, queer, Canadian, in America on a work visa, and part of the leather community. And this is still, since yesterday, not related to big data all that much directly. But I think it's important that we build diverse communities, uh, especially for those of us who are building machine learning models, so that we take into account what the world is around us, and we don't just recreate the same bad shit faster. Um, so hopefully, we can all work together and solve some cool problems. And if your team looks entirely like you, this is a thing you should fix. Um, even if this is an open source, it is still a thing you should fix. If it was your five friends from college and now you're working together, you know, you may all have very similar backgrounds and you should get some other people involved. Okay, so I'm gonna talk really briefly about what Kubernetes is, how it's different from Yarn, um, some nice things about this. Uh, then we'll talk about how to switch to using Kubernetes for Spark. Um, I'm going to skip the brief tour into Kubeflow. That's just not going to happen with uh, the joys of our setup work. Um, but Wi-Fi cooperating will mostly do demos. Uh, they all involve word count. I know everyone loves word count, so that's, that's going to be real exciting. Um, and then I'll talk about sort of why, while well, you can indeed use Spark on Kubernetes today, uh, our plans to try and make it better and our other areas to, to improve here. Uh, so Kubernetes is a new open source cluster manager, and it uses containers. OK. <laughs> I thought that was a fun joke. Uh, it runs programs in Linux containers, and it has a lot of contributors, um, over 60,000 commits recently. Uh, ooh, OK, so now we can see it. Um, actually, we've got our, our kernel. We have little containers. It's Docker rather than shipping containers. Um, and we deploy our applications inside of it. And for those of you who are coming from the Yarn world, uh, this is kind of exciting, especially for those of you working in Python. Uh, you probably are in a situation where you'll want to use libraries, and then your cluster does not have the libraries that you want to use, and now your life is sad. Um, and with Docker uh, and Kubernetes, uh, your life won't be sad because of that. It will be sad for other reasons. Um, so that's, that's nice, right? Uh, OK. Uh, so more isolation is good, right? Um, and this is really nice. It means that if you and your coworker need to deploy Spark, different versions of Spark or even the same version of Spark, but you depend on different Python libraries, you don't have to worry about stepping on each other's toes. Um, this is really, really convenient. Um, I, I know I keep coming back to this, but if you've, if you've worked in the Yarn world, you know how painful this can be. 
Um, we can also virtualize a bunch of networking stuff. Uh, for the most part, that doesn't really give us a lot of benefits in the Spark world. It just makes my life harder because I misconfigure firewalls frequently. Um, but that's, that's OK. Um, and we can also uh, have other levels of isolation. Um, we can specify maximum memory usage. Um, this is useful so that we don't stomp on each other's uh, containers when we're running in production. We can throttle CPUs. This is really useful if you want to have some burst capabilities for perhaps your you know, batch analytics job that isn't super important but should run at a lower priority than your real-time jobs. Um, and we can do all kinds of fun configuration stuff. Um, and there, there are persistent volumes, and you can use them with Spark. I, you probably shouldn't. Uh, it'll go poorly, but that's okay. That's okay. Uh, and, oh, right, there's also credential management, uh, the default of which is base64 encoding. Really, really very high security right there. Um, so, but there, there are alternatives to depending on, on the secrets of Base64 encoding, um, which actually, uh, when, a long time ago when I was a systems administrator, uh, we were doing a migration. It was going to be very painful because, of course, we assumed that we had stored the user passwords in a very secure manner, and we were setting up a new authentication system. But then we looked at it, and I was like, well, these, these user passwords look a little funny. I uh, wonder, wonder what happens if I try base64 decoding them. And then I found some references to how delicious juice was, and I was like, this is probably not a one-way hash. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's a similar experience that you can have when you're playing around with Kubernetes secrets. Okay, so the main thing that we get from deploying on top of Kubernetes is that we can have our dependencies nicely managed, things like Spacey, scikit-learn, TensorFlow, these are things which are really painful to manage on our own. Um, the solutions for people in the yarn space have tended to be a shared conda environment, and that's certainly better than nothing. Um, it's not great, uh, but supporting different versions of libraries is kind of hard, um, and it tends to also involve uh, sort of an administrator. And in my experiences, things that involve administrators, they get done eventually, but not very quickly, right? Uh, on, certainly not in the span of from last night to this morning in time for a demo, right? And so because my life is largely focused on things like that, it's uh, not a good plan. Okay, so what does our fine architecture look like? Uh, we'll have nodes. Nodes can have multiple containers deployed on them. Um, and the, the other thing is, like, we can... Uh, we can put Spark alongside our other applications, right? If you're just deploying Spark, setting up a Kubernetes cluster is probably overkill. But there's a good chance that you have other things that can also be deployed on Kubernetes, and then you can deploy these on the same cluster without having to have sort of multiple cluster management solutions, right? Um, and so yay, happiness. Uh, and note that the IPs being different means that if your firewall rules were written uh, for the nodes, uh, yeah, you, you, you're going to add another firewall rule, um, which screwed me up last night. Anyways, um, it's cool. We get nice isolation. Everything's happy. Uh, that being said, everything can go wrong, but that's OK. Um, so how does big data on Kubernetes work? Um, the non-JVM support is relatively new. Um, so if you've been trying to use this before, uh, it's, it's been pretty much focused on just supporting Scala and Java. And at that point, all of the cool things that we get with containers, we don't really care about, because Java has a pretty easy dependency management story. Um, client mode is new in Spark 2.4, and this means that we can now run interactive applications. Historically, uh, we could only run batch applications. Um, there is Kerberos support. It's an exciting opportunity to possibly lose you Kerberos tickets to anyone on your Kubernetes cluster, but it might not be broken. Um, and if you're willing to try that out and file bug reports, please do. Um, yeah, cool. And lots of refactors because there were a lot of bugs, and rather than fixing them, we figured we'd just rewrite the code and close all of the bugs as fixed. Uh, so that was a good plan. So how does, how does Spark on Kubernetes itself work? Um, so we have our configuration. We request executors. We remove executors. And the Kubernetes scheduler eventually gives us our containers. Um, it handles communication. It's very happy. Um, the Kubernetes scheduler 
you don't have to worry about it too much if you're from just traditional Spark world. You can think of it as Yarn, but with a different set of bugs. Um, and so then, ooh, what happened? OK, whatever. Um, that was not intentional in any way, shape, or form. That, that is still not intentional. Oh, dear. OK. Um, OK, so we have our, our client. We schedule a job. We schedule a driver pod. Um, our driver pod is going to go ahead and make some further resource requests. It's going to ask for some executors. It goes ahead. We schedule our executor pods. They could get scheduled on the same nodes or different nodes, um, really depending on how many we're asking for and what kind of memory uh, and other jobs are scheduled. Um, and then we, yeah. Uh, another person can schedule a second job. The second job will have its own driver and its own executor pods. Um, Yay. And you can have multi-tenancy with things that are not Spark, right? That's, that's the important part. If you're just using Spark, you probably only want Yarn. Um, so how do we change our application to run on top of Kubernetes? So in theory, we could just replace the configuration where we tell Spark to run on Yarn with master Kubernetes. In practice, if you do that, that's an exciting opportunity for your job to fail. Um, so what we need to do is we need to change our master to point to Kubernetes. We need to build a container which has all of our dependencies inside of it. Uh, we probably need to change our storage systems around. If you're on top of Yarn, there's a good chance that you've been using something like HDFS. Um, we don't have that, so you're going to have to pick S3 or GCSS. Um, then you're going to change your cluster manager, and then you find out that all of your tuning stuff is now completely garbage. Um, and so you get to start over with Spark tuning, uh, which is a really great way to spend somewhere between a month and my entire life. Um, and so then we do this, we get a job, we iteratively improve it, and eventually it works. Um, and then by the time it works, someone comes up with a new cluster manager. OK. So with that exciting start, we're going to go into my demo of word count. And there is a recorded demo. I'm not going to play it for you, because um, it has swearing in it. Uh, my boss told, oh, there's, OK, whatever. Water is going to go here. OK, so let's see if I can do word count. Um, hopefully, I can. I've only been working with this system for five years. Um, admittedly, I've been working with Kubernetes since about a week ago. Um, so. I, okay, uh, is this text readable to people? Okay, cool. Uh, I'm going to make it smaller so you can't read it then. Uh, okay, cool. So um, I've downloaded Spark. This is Spark 2.4. Uh, and since I'm on Google Cloud, um, rather than as Amazon, um, there's some extra little steps that I had to do. Uh, but first, how we would start is we would go, there's a bin directory, and there's this Docker image tool. Um, and this Docker image tool builds a Docker image. It doesn't put any of your special sauce inside of it, but it builds a Docker image uh, with what uh, Spark needs. Um, this will give us something that we can use as a base to then put whatever special sauce we need inside of it. So then we can write a, a Docker file um, to, to add some special sauce. And in this case, my special sauce um, and I'm sorry for using Nano. I just don't have Emacs installed on this remote machine. Um, I should have thought that through. I lost all of my street cred right in like 30 seconds. I, anyways, OK. So uh, we can see here we've got booze demo projects are rad. So that's my, my Docker registry. And I'm using the Python Spark one. Oh, man, people are taking pictures. Fuck. I can't even claim I didn't do this. OK. Um, and then, because it turns out that while I said Java has an excellent dependency management solution, what I really mean is, oh god, oh god, <laughs> the shading hurts. Um, so we delete an old version of Guava. Don't ask any questions. That's totally normal. Um, and then we tell Spark that, or sorry, we tell Docker that we want this random other version of Guava. That's fine. Somehow this works. I, I continue to be surprised. Um, and then we tell it that we want to use the GCS connector. Um, and you don't have to do this for like all of your Java dependencies, but since we're going to use the GCS connector to like load in our Java files or our Python files, we need to make sure that it's in our initial container base. Um, that being said, if you were on Amazon, S3 support is integrated. Uh, but I work for Google, and so 
Yeah, cool. And it's not just us, right? Like Microsoft um, also joined the party uh, and is not integrated into the core either. So we, we have to do a similar ad thing if you want to run on top of Microsoft. And that gives us blob storage. The two bottom lines are commented out in the bottom. If you're doing this on Spark 2.3, you need those lines. If you're doing this on Spark 2.4, you put those lines in and it doesn't work. That's normal. Everything is normal. OK. So we'd go ahead, we'd build this new Docker file, we'd push it, and um, so I'd do a Docker build. I'm not going to do the, the Docker build because this takes a while, but you know, we'd just do this Docker build, and we'd say, this is the version I'm building. You can note that there's a dash 4 at the end, which tells you how many times it took me to get this right. Um, we build it, and then we do a Docker push, and, and we're happy, and now we can use Spark Submit. Um, I really hope uh, this is the right Spark Submit. OK, so uh, we're going to use Spark Submit. We tell it we've got this uh, local Kubernetes thing. Now, this isn't Minikube. I just set up a uh, Kubernetes proxy. Um, makes it easier for me. Uh, we tell it that we're deploying in cluster mode. And in cluster mode, what happens is we deploy the driver program uh, inside of Kubernetes. And this is really useful um, because then if my computer crashes, my Spark job still runs. Like That's really good. The downside of it is that I can't really use it interactively. right? I don't have like a shell to, to go and press buttons. So if I wanted to use interactive queries, uh, cluster mode would be a little rough. And then we tell it to point at the random image that I just built. We tell it the number of executors we want. And we give it a service account, which has permissions to create those executors on the cluster. Uh, and then we give it a pointer to our file here. I'm using Python. If you were using Java, it would just be a .jar. It's totally, totally the same stuff. And then I give it any of the inputs to my job. So we're going to run this. And there's at least a 20% chance it's going to succeed. Um, so who's with me? Yeah? Yay! At least 20 people don't hate me. Cool. Let's find out. OK, cool. Well, so the first thing, it starts off by telling me that I should use HTTPS, but security is for suckers. Um, OK, and it gives me this pod name, so that's exciting. That means I think our odds are up to like about 50% by now. It means that we scheduled a job, and this is exciting. And I can go ahead, and I can go over here, and I can get the logs for that. Cool. Uh, so you can see, actually, it finished. Oh. Fuck. Well, I was hoping it would take longer. I should have given it some uh, bigger input. But we can see it counted some words. Very exciting. It's genuine big data. We did word count. Yeah? Yay! You are the second audience I've tricked into clapping for word count this year. I'm really excited. Or not tricked, sorry. <clears throat> My boss says I should communicate more carefully. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's a good thing he doesn't watch just these videos. Um, OK, anyways, so we, we counted some words. This looks pretty solid. Um, and that's, that's cool, right? Kind of? Almost. OK, so um, that's, that's demo number one. We can do a word count application pretty much the same as we could on any other backend. Um, that being said, there's a chance that your company has a Kubernetes cluster you can deploy on top of, and that might make your life easier. So we're going to do a second demo, but I don't remember what it is, so I'm going to print space. OK, we're going to do word count in client mode. Yeah, OK. Let's see if this works. Uh, Spark-shell. Uh-oh. OK, cool. Um, <clears throat> so there's some extra bits that we had to add to make client mode work. And there's actually some other extra bits that I, I'll show just talk about, because if I show you them, it's depressing. Um, so one of the things is, in client mode, uh, we need the Kubernetes pods to come back and talk to our host. Right? They have to be able to talk to where we're running our driver program so that we can submit jobs to them and get results back. Right? We need to have that network communication. So we have to tell it what our IP address is, because otherwise it defaults to the host name. And in that case, for some reason, it doesn't work. Um, if you have DNS properly set up on your network, probably don't have to specify this IP address. Uh, we also specify a port, and then everything else is pretty much the same, except we also specify a port for the block manager. right? And those are the two things we have to do differently. And then we're going to run this. It's probably going to work, and I'm going to do word count a second time. Really excited. I, I managed to fit three word counts in this talk. Um, we, we might cut one of them for time. I don't know how I'm doing on time. It's, uh, whatever. He's zoned out. It's fine. Um, Cool. So we can see here, uh oh, 
Oh, that's bad. Uh, huh. Oh, okay. I don't know if this is going to work or not, um, and I'll tell you why. Uh, so there's this little warning message here, right? Um, and it says that it can't bind to port, the port that I specified. And that's OK if it successfully passed that information to the workers. But if it didn't pass that information to the workers, it's not going to work. But that's OK. Let's find out together. Yeah? And if it doesn't work, we'll know why. And then it would just be change the port number. And, and that's totally OK. So we're going to do the same thing. Uh, text file. Oh, man. I think I can spell the word diversity. Um, I think I remember which side the I goes on. Diversity. Yeah, that sounds right. OK. Uh, Jupyter underscore new dot sh. Cool. Um, OK, normally we'd go and do the rest of the word count, but I'm not entirely sure if I spelled diversity right or if this is going to succeed. So we're just going to do a job right away, and we're going to see if this works. OK, this looks pro hey, it worked. <laughs> Yay! As I always say, the key to success is lowered standards. Um, OK, so I could go ahead and type word count a second time. Uh, and I probably should just, you know, just in case the union's watching. Um, OK, and then, uh, yeah. Oh, reduce by key, underscore, plus underscore. Cool. Um, OK, res one dot collect. This probably works. If it doesn't, I'll be mildly embarrassed. OK, cool. It worked. That's awesome. So OK, so we did work count a second time. That's great. Uh, how many people in here use Jupyter Notebooks? That is a lot of people. Uh, relatedly, I hope you test your code. Um, OK, so demo number three, I remember what we're going to do, because I was doing this until about 3 o'clock today, and it wasn't fucking working. Um, but it works now, and, um, and my life is terrible. Oh, right, so the other thing that I had to do to make this work uh, is change some firewall settings. And I was just like, you know what? Screw it. We'll just make everything talk to everything except for the internet. And that, that worked out fine. Uh, in practice, you're, you're going to want to you know, those ports that we set, you're going to specify those exact ports in your firewall rules rather than just going for everything. Um, but uh, the problem is because we get a different subnet for our container IPs than uh, the one that we already had before, uh, the default firewall rules I had didn't work super great. OK. So now we're going to try demo number three. Oh, fuck. Jupyter Notebook. Uh, hmm. Failed reverse search is not a good sign if I'm trying to do a demo. OK, so Jupyter Notebook. We're going to launch a notebook. My work. Cool. Um, OK, let's uh, see if this works. Uh, OK. Well, uh, cool. It worked. Oh, and I have the sample file from earlier because I saved it, so I don't have to type it again. I'm really smart. Oh, and I can show you a bug that I found while I was doing this. So uh, that's not the bug. <laughs> I, I'm not that superstitious, but I'm not going to say that B word again. Um, OK, so no one can read this text, so that's great. Uh, it's a good start. Best demos are the ones where people can't ask you what the hell's going on. OK, so um, this is pretty similar. The difference is we can't configure it with command line arguments, so we construct a Spark Conf object, and we set many of the same parameters. Uh, it's, it's pretty much the same thing. The difference here is um, this is a Python 3 notebook, so I set the Python version to 3. However, if we scroll down just a little bit, there's this little note here that says, unfortunate, smiley, sad face. Um, and that turns out that there's a bug uh, wherein uh, when you specify the Python version, we promptly ignore it. Um, it makes it a lot faster, uh, but doesn't give you any answers. Uh, so that's great. Uh, and if we run this, it might work. Um, did I exit the other one? 
Well, uh, yeah, whatever. Let's, uh, let's run this, right? Run all. Who knows? Maybe it'll work. Uh, and, ooh. OK, so now we're creating our Spark context. Um, in, ooh, that uh, looks like it worked. So let's go ahead and take a look. Yeah, did it, did it? OK, thank god. Um, so over here, I have the Spark Web UI. Uh, this is the port, I think, for this one. And we can indeed see that this is actually has these 1056 ones. It's not, actu it's not just the driver. It is properly configured. It, it got to Kubernetes executors to, to do its work. Um, and I mean, they're not doing any tasks because we finished our word count example. Um, turns out I probably should have picked like a gigabyte of information instead of a kilobyte, but whatever, it's fine. So um, that's word count again, and we can use it in a notebook. And this is this is kind of convenient, um, especially if you're using something like uh, Jupyter Lab and you're you're deploying on top of Kubernetes, anyways. Um, and so this is this is kind of fun. Um, the configuration is kind of garbage, uh, and we should really fix that Python version issue. But uh, eh, I'll get to it later. Um, maybe maybe once I'm finally home for 48 hours. Um, okay, cool. So those are the three demos, and I've got seven minutes left, but I'm pretty sure I don't actually have seven minutes left. So what does the future look like? Um, a whole lot of things are missing in our Kubernetes support. Um, dynamic scaling, kind of a little rough. Um, one of the things which is also a little rough is our storage support. Um, I, I would like us to automatically Take the files that you're submitting to Spark and, and put them in a cloud storage thing that you've configured so you don't have to manually copy it. I'm kind of lazy. I think that would be nice. Um, it would be cool if our authentication integration was less sketchy. Um, we'll, we'll leave it at that. Uh, but if you are curious and would like to be sad, uh, you can go look at the Kubernetes, um, no, Kubernetes, Kubernetes Kerberos Spark integration. When you put those three words together, you get a very sad cluster. Um, and uh, better documentation. Uh, so none of the things that I showed you were particularly documented, or the parts that were were documented incorrectly, like the Python version setting. Um, dynamic scaling might sound pretty simple, right? Um, we can just request more executors. Um, and that's cool, but there's this like inconvenient problem where sometimes jobs need to scale down, right? Like the holidays happen and you scale up, but after that, it's not like you get Q4 indefinitely forever afterwards. Um, and scaling down means that um, this is bad because we lose all of your files right now. Um, and so we lose all of the intermediate work and we have to recompute them. Like it doesn't lead to correctness issues, but it leads to slowness. Um, and we could do smart scale down. Uh, we could add a shuffle service so we'd only scale down the executors, or we could migrate the shuffle files on scale down. One of the two doesn't doesn't really matter. Um, and then then our stuff will not be terrible in the event that you have to scale down. Um, that might happen next year, maybe if we're lucky. Okay, so. Um, if this sounds like an adventure you want to do, um, ideally you're the kind of person whose compensation is not directly tied to your performance, and you can spend a lot of time just submitting bug reports and open source pull requests to help us fix our software. Um, but if that is you, please come join us. Uh, we need more of you. Um, and I have some uh, blog posts and there's some documentation. Uh, I, if you thought those demos went well and want to see the hour-long struggle to get it to work at the start um, because of that fucking network configuration, uh, you can watch this really depressing live stream. Um, and if you're interested just more generally in contributing to open source, uh, if you don't have like several weeks to spend, that's totally fine. Uh, I do open source code review live streams that I think are pretty cool. Um, but I'm down to four minutes, and I would like time for a question. Oh, right, and we have the most important parts coming up next. Here's a bunch of books on Spark. I wrote some of them. Other people wrote the other ones. They're pretty cool. This one, I got a better royalty deal on. Um, it doesn't cover any of the content in today's talk either, uh, but that, once again, should not stop you from purchasing it. Um, yeah, the, the Kubernetes integration came after I wrote this book. Uh, but you can still buy it anyways. And uh, if you have small children who 
you would like to introduce to the concept of distributed systems, I hope you will join me uh, at distributedcomputingforkids.com. Um, and, and I want to be clear, this is not a joke. Um, many people laugh when I tell them this, but I, I actually think that we can use distributed systems like Apache Spark to teach children functional programming at a young age um, and get them before they learn about mutation. Uh, and anyways. Maybe not, maybe maybe this is a terrible idea, but hopefully you'll still buy the book anyways. Um, that's the most important part. Okay, uh, if anyone wants to fly to San Francisco tomorrow, I'm giving a talk there on Saturday. Um, if you're tired of nice weather, I'll be in London in December. Um, and if you like barbecue, I'll be in Texas uh, in January. Um, I'm probably gonna be somewhere in February, but I forgot to write it down. Uh, okay, cool. So that's that's pretty much it. Um, if you want to give me feedback, there's a link here. Um, I have a testing Spark survey that I'm always trying to get people to fill out. If you run Spark in production, please fill it out, um, and we can get people to do better choices with testing uh, and validation. Um, I'll be around. My jacket lights up. Um, you can probably find me, even if the batteries run out, I suspect. Um, and, and I'll be around to answer questions for a while. And then I'm going to go get some delicious ham. Um, so thank, thank you all. Okay. This is the moment for the question. And I know that there are many people with many questions. I mean, it, it looks like it's, it's full. no questions. I don't no, see it's, any questions. It should be question. I don't know. Oh, right, I've got that thing right after this, right? The, where people can come and ask me questions. Do you know yes. where it is? Yes. Just go outside and ask the expert in the front at the right. They can go there. And okay, ask cool. So you can ask me questions now, now and then. And then. Well, or just then, because it doesn't look like anyone wants to ask a question right now. It's, it's yes, okay. there is one guy oh, with one, one question. question. Okay, I, I'm going to give you a microphone. Microphone, please, for him. Okay. One microphone for If you want to yell, I can repeat your question. No, it's much better because the, the one at the back is not going to hear it. Okay. Okay. In the middle. The guy with glasses with the hand at the, like this? <laughs> the huh? guy with glasses is not, really. <laughs> if I say the lady with Christmas... Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> For you, it's easier. You know. Right, yeah, no, it's fine. I accept. Hi. Hi. So at Transmarch in San this Francisco, people cannot find me because it's like the girl with the pink hair and the mermaid dress, and they're like, shit, there's like seven of you. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, this, sorry. Yeah, this, this one is actually coming from, the, from my friend in my, in my right. Okay, who's he is, very yeah. shy. <laughs> he, yeah, he's very shy. Um, you work for Google, but you were using Nature. Why is that? Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. I like what about no, Google no, no. Cloud. <laughs> so, so um, I want to be clear. The demo was actually on Google Cloud, but it could also run on top of Azure. The the code supports both paths, um, and that's just because uh, I don't know why not support the alternatives. Like, there's. Okay, of course my employer would love it if you ran on top of Google Cloud. And I, of course, would also love it. I like money. Um, I'll like a lot. I have to pay rent in San Francisco. But realistically, I don't really care. Um, I just want this stuff to work, and I want you to get your job done. Um, and if, incidentally, you pay my employer money, that's good. There are cameras rolling. So please, definitely buy Google Cloud. Buy six clouds. <laughs> Thank you so much.